Good evening, everybody, and thank you, Luca, for this opportunity. Before uh, I uh, prepared something to say, I thought about where do we find in your where do we find innovation nowadays? And I think we find innovation in academia, in research centers, and in, in the corporate world, in the private enterprises. So I will start this conversation by quoting a statistic. In 2020, the year of COVID, the overall Italian exports grew by 1.1%. I think this fact symbolizes better than anything the mindset of a whole society. In order to sell in very competitive and shrinking markets, you need to produce something that is scarce and appealing. In other words, you need to innovate. You need to develop a new concept or a new item, plus finding a project manager and a financing agent. So what does an Italian innovator consist in? It is preferably or probably the access to a history 2,500 year old to a very diverse territory that bridges across two continents, or perhaps it is the easiness to extract ideas, shapes, and storytelling from an extraordinary cultural heritage and background that makes the trick. So any explanation must, though, make allowance for the peculiar features of a nation that has collected throughout its existence a sensational notion for research in the spirit of competition. And speaking of research, I will wrap up by saying that nowadays, 40% of the Italian academia and universities are encompassed in the ranking of the best thousand colleges in the world. So the tip of despair is, of course, ancient art and history, which is taught by La Sapienza, and which puts La Sapienza as university number one in the world for that faculty. Moreover, in spite of the public expenditure in research, which is, which is dramatically low, Italy ranks nevertheless number, y, number, number five in Europe, for the number of projects approved and financed by the European Research Agency. And again, by this statistic, you can understand, you can appreciate the ingenuity, the, 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 the capacity of the whole Italian system, which actually is punching above its weight in this time of COVID. So Luca, thank you very much for what we are going to say, which is of course ranks from literature to music, to art and to uh, all the beautiful things that only a specialist like you can, can think about. And I, I leave the floors to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the introduction and also for sponsoring this uh, lecture series. This is the second event uh, that I'm doing this year. Uh, there will be other uh, five coming up uh, from here to the fall. Uh, so make sure to check it out on uh, on your on the social media of Italian innovators. Um, now in this presentation, uh, I really would like to trace an ideal profile of the Italian innovator and. I always talk about Italian innovators in my YouTube channel, and I had a chance to interview quite a few of them. So as a way to both introduce and summarize the project, I would like to isolate some common traits in the protagonists of my presentations and interviews. I would like to locate a common DNA in their work across different fields, so music, technology, business, fashion, design. And I would like to detect in their common, in their common soil, really, the specific elements of an Italian way to innovation and entrepreneurship. Now, this inquiry on the qualities of the original or ur Italian innovator is not a mere exercise or an abstract game, uh, but rather an attempt to, re to respond to a genuine question, which is where is innovation or originality born? Uh, what are the models 
that underlie the creation of something truly new. And in the Italian milieu, which is often self-defined by critics as a literary civilization and by customers as a design civilization, what is the relationship between the intellectual and the material spheres? How do literary strategies to achieve newness, freshness, and relevance in a book define the mental soil of designers and impact their methods to create originality in a product? In walking the, the subtle line between literary imagination and design thinking, I will observe a few archetypical figures of Italian culture and industry from a reverse perspective. So we'll observe culture from a business standpoint and entrepreneurship from the point of view of culture. Now, as a way to start, I would like to draw your attention on two figures of Italian music. One is uh, the composer of what we heard before, the 20, uh, Caprice 24 uh, Paganini, the 19th century violinist Niccolò Paganini. And the other is the 20th century conductor Arturo Toscanini. Now, the one, the virtuoso, obsessively focused on one instrument, the solo instrument, you see the, the virtuosity of, of the player uh, in, in the video that I was showing you earlier. So the virtuoso obsessively focused on one instrument or the instrument. And the other, the conductor, focused on the orchestra, the ensemble. In, the, in their operative modes, Paganini and Toscanini embody really two key Italian paths to innovation. The one focusing on the zealous, almost compulsive attention to the inimitable purity or perfection of one ingredient, and the other aiming at the balance of different voices at their temperate combination or amalgamation. If you're familiar with Italian literature, and I will expose you tonight to some of it, these two patterns, the ingredient and the platform, are reflected in the two key medieval paradigms of literary creation, Petrarch's monolingualism and Dante, Dante's multilingualism. Now allow me to expand a little bit on their diverse approaches to literary imagination in order to trace their long-term mental impact on Italy's entrepreneurial models. Now for Petrarch, the perfection of the poetic world consists in its consistency, purity, and rarefaction. We could easily compare Petrarch's mastery of lyrical language in his canzoniere to the virtuoso ability of Paganini to hone the sound and expression of his violin. In the case of Petrarch, the locus of undivided attention, the prima donna, or the is language itself its perfectness, its uniqueness, its wholeness, its coherent stylization. Now, if we were to translate this attitude in entrepreneurial terms, Petrarch's ideal of perfection as an obsessive quest for the purity of the ingredient would translate into the premium model, the excellence niche, the exclusive focus on the flawlessness of a standalone product. According to this model, the distinctive element of value or innovation is the visible difference, which is to be found either in a superior ingredient or in a masterful execution. Now, this brilliance of the ingredient sets a bar and a model of imitation. Petrarch's 30 year work perfecting the canzoniere and his literary format and polishing his literary expression would provide a century long framework for European poetry from Shakespeare to Tasso, Leopardi and Ungaretti. The same phenomenon, however, applies to the material world. For example, in the craft of violin making, the model of excellence set by the 16th century master Luthier, Stradivari, Amati and Guarnieri not only define an unparalleled bar of perfection, but also continues to impart the Italian positioning in the contemporary industry. So in a mass market of violins for learners dominated by China, Italy actually still controls the niche market of first-class violins for performers. The same logic applies to food, 
where the excellence of production and subsequent positioning in the premium category relates to the finding, the perfecting and refining of one ingredient. We see this in artisanal pasta, the salame felino, the torrone condorelli or the parmigiano reggiano. The monolingualism of the product, this masterful, masterful pursuit of the perfect ingredient also refers to the primary elements of a product as well as to matter itself. With regard to the elements, the focus on the ingredients finds expression in the success of Italian companies like Casadei, top brand in the production of stiletto and high ear heels, it's like they dominate the Hollywood market there, of Brugola, which is like probably the uh, most sold Italian product in America. It's the world indisputable leader in the production of bolts and critical fasteners. And also in Brembo, which is the number one company in the production of brakes for all sports cars. Now, with regard to prime materials, the Italian obsession for matter finds expression in the tradition of glass making, wood carving, or stone cutting. Now, glass is not a precious material. It's actually not even recyclable, despite what we say. Uh, yet, in the Murano workshop, it is elevated to art and brought to aesthetic relevance. Wood is animated like from the medieval choirs here is like the Frari in Venice, the Frari church to the 15th century humanistic studiolo by Melozzo da Forlì in the court of Urbino. Now from the archetype of Geppetto the carpenter to the Italian leadership in furniture, in furniture making as expressed in Milan's Salone del Mobile, the most important event in the sector. Marble is seen as the perfect stone, both in its pure essence as the Carrara quarries provided the material for Milan's cathedral or Michelangelo's statues, and in its cutting, as seen in the Italian excellence in sculpture and masonry in public buildings all over the United States, really. So Italy's monolingualism also applies to modern materials like aluminum or steel. Now at the time of autarky, autarky during fascism, a poor metal like aluminum, aluminum reached perfection of execution through the work of the aluminum master Alfonso Bialetti, who created through it the iconic coffee pot, the mocha in 1933. And in our present, the Italian company Cimolai, um, one of the world's leading manufacturers of quality steel, turned steel from a construction tool into a versatile aesthetic material, as we see in the vessel in New York, in the Reggio Emilia railway station or in the Olympic Stadium of Athens. Now, if we were to find an Italian paraphrase of uh, Marshall McLuhan's famous expression, the medium is the message, we should then say matter is the story or rather the carrier is the meaning. In, Renaissance, in the Renaissance with gold, which is turned by Lorenzo Ghiberti into a storytelling device in his Porta del Paradiso, or with bronze, which is turned into the subject of an epic fight in Benvenuto Cellini's narration of his creation of the statue of Perseus. Uh, it's in the Loggia in Florence. Now, if for Petrarch, poetic perfection consists in the rarefaction and wholesome, wholesomeness of language, for Dante, on the contrary, Poetry finds its maximum expression in the hybridization of different timbers, voices, registers, and dialects, and in their harmonization in, on, in an all-embracing vision. Now, in a literary work like the comedy, where swear words are woven with theological discourse, where the shitty nails of Thais the whore in Inferno 18 inhabit the same literary space as the love that moves the sun and the other stars in the ultimate vision of God in Paradise 33, the artistry of the poet coincides with that of the conductor who is not fixed on the atomistic vision or on a few hypertrophic elements, but rather on their temperate interaction, on their balanced construction of a total meaning. So in an orchestra, there is a bassoon and a violin, okay? So as in the orchestra model that we traced where the individual voice finds perfection in the symphonic balance of diversities, 
and the common melody is carried over by multiple instruments, the genre of the comedy is an interactional space where themes, languages, or voices overlap and balance each other, both vertically and horizontally. In vertical terms, the author relates to his classical models with a logic of stratification and fusion. The same that we find, for example, in Italian architecture, which is similarly conceived as a layering of, space, of styles, inputs, and elements coming from different ages or civilizations. Now, in, in horizontal terms, the comedy offers not just like a platter of random elements, like as in the Latin genre of satura, but rather a platform where an overarching aesthetic idea or vision of the world can acquire its brilliance through what Dante calls concinitas, so the singing together of different expressions. It doesn't come as a surprise then that Dante's poetry actually becomes melody in the numerous psalms that are sung throughout the poem. It becomes dance in the harmony of bodies in paradise, and it becomes architecture in the elaborate construction of the otherworldly space. Now, this totalizing and multidisciplinary tension is actually the trademark of many aesthetic movements generated in Italy, from the Renaissance to the Baroque, and in the 20th century from futurism to neorealism. Now, whether a posteriori or in a, a priori theory, these movements actually share the orchestra model in their tension to transport one aesthetic idea or the melody from a specific language or art to another, in their audacity to actually translate and, temper and temperate literature into painting or sculpture or architecture. From what I can say, and this is kind of a, as a way of comparison, in the European context, movements like the Sturm und Drang or French Impressionism or literary modernism, yes, have a transnational, transnational reach, but very rarely, very seldom, they have a transdisciplinary model. Now, a business equivalent equivalence to this uh, polyphonic model is offered by Davide Campari. And uh, let me and also by uh, Adriano Olivetti, who really elaborated a similar vision of their products as generative platforms of interdisciplinary connections. Now, Davide Campari conceived his drink, not by chance a mixer in a cocktail, as a locus of concinitas, singing together, as artists from different spheres reinterpreted it through multiple voices. So the ironsmith Alessandro Mazzucotelli, who designed the iron chandelier of his Bar Camparino in the Galleria Vittorio Emanuele in Milan, the illustrators Marcello Dudovic or Leonetto Cappiello and Marcello Nizzoli, who designed their art posters, the painter Fortunato De Pero, who designed the icon, the architectural pavilions of, of the company. And coming close to our present, the top fashion photographer Christian Schuller, who authored the 2013 calendar with Penelope Cruz, it's really a, a piece of art, it's actually my favorite, go check it out. And also top directors like Fellini, and uh, more close to us, Paolo Sorrentino, who authored an ad uh, and a mini movie called uh, Killer in Red, I highly recommend, 10 minutes uh, worth your time. Now, in a similar way, Adriano Olivetti made his typewriter business a similar laboratory of encounter between technology and design, philosophy and engineering, architecture and politics, through the hiring of top designers like Nizzoli, Sozzas, this is his Valentin Bellini, uh, it's Divi Sumo, or leading engineers like Perotto, who developed in 1964 the first computer, or architects like Pollini and Figini, who in the 1930s designed the headquarters of the company in Ivrea in the rationalist style, or Carlos Carpa, who designed the Olivetti Store Museum in Venice, or Marco Zanuso, who designed the uh, Olivetti factory in Sao Paulo, modeling like the gears of the machine onto an architectural space, or for example, through the transformation of Ivrea by Adriano Olivetti into a city built around the factory. And starting from there, a city which could represent a social and political model of what he called the comunità. So we saw wholeness 
and hybridity. Now, let me add a second literary opposition, which is the 16th century rivalry of Ariosto and Tasso to expand our reflections on originality. Now, Ariosto and Tasso are the authors of the two most read chivalric poems of the 16th century, the Orlando Furioso and the Jerusalem Delivered. Now, the Orlando Furioso is an open-ended narration with no precise start and no clear end constructed as a continuum of weaving stories in a dynamic movement of ramification and variation. The Jerusalem delivered instead follows a beginning development and scheme, framing the story into a self-contained theater. In the first model, originality is achieved through a combinatory game. In the second, through heightened emotions. Now, Ariosto's method consists in the infinite ramification of one theme, which is love as folly, as craziness, which is explored through an endless weaving of variations, stories, and deviations. Now, a contemporary visual equivalent for Ariosto's narrative space can be found in the endless experimentation on bottles by the 20th century painter Giorgio Morandi who configured, configured the serial space of his still life canvases as a similar mental quest for variations in their different shape, lights, and colors. In this game, actually bottles even end up mimicking the towery skyline of his hometown, Bologna. Such dynamic pursuits of deviation in the ramification of variables is actually a key method for creating originality in design as well especially with objects like chairs or bottles that are already well-defined. We can see this, for example, in Boccioni's rendering of a bottle in space, or in the Perro's shifting game, turning a conic element of his own children's theater or painting into the plastic form of a new bottle. We can also see this in the design of chairs, which is the other obsession of Italian design from Carlo Bugatti's play on exotic variables in his chair, like this uh, Liberty chair too. Probably you've seen this um, Gaetano Pesce's uh, series Up, transforming a chair into the figure of a woman embracing the uh, person who sits. This logic of transportation of one theme from one realm to another that we see, for example, in Ariosto's image of the shipping of, the, of Ariosto's bottled brain to the moon. Or, for example, we see this in science, in, um, in Galileo's idea to move the telescope from the seas to the moon or his own uh, prose from Latin to Italian, this method of transposition is also a key path of mechanical innovation as also attested in the work of Corradino Dascanio, which is the design, who is the designer of Vespa. Now Dascanio planned for Aero Piaggio uh, sturdy yet light bodies for helicopters and 30s. And after the war, he really transposed the idea of the light yet sturdy body from airplanes to a two-wheel vehicle. And he shifted the scooters that he saw used by American parachuters during World War II from a means to rapidly move behind the enemy line into a light carrier for urban mobility. Now, Tasso's model instead is that of the enclosed stage, dominated by rigid units of time and space. Within this strict space, Tasso's way to original expression consists in the heightening of feelings, in a performative tension of self-overcoming. Now in his theatrical space, poetry overflows into music as, for example, in Monteverdi's experiments, musical experiments with his madrigals, and poetry overflows into the visual arts, as we see, for example, in the success of Jerusalem Liberata in the paintings of Luca Giordano in Naples and Tiepolo in Venice. Now, in this theatrical self-containment, poetry really tends to become melodrama, anticipating its performative expression of feelings. So in Tasso's closed laboratory, emotions are brought to their maximum height and details, characters and events are forced 
to exude their emotional pathos as a way to transcend their established limit. Such energy finds expression also in the design of objects, in the heightening of their emotional impact, as we can see in the red plated Valentine by Ettore Sozzas, which turns a typewriter into a sexy object of passion and desire. Or we can see this in the costumes of Academy Award winner designer Milena Canonero, who turns historical dresses into abiti, habits, which means both dresses and characters in English. So habits becomes temperaments, dresses become characters. Now in advertising, this theatricality finds expression in the early opera posters by recorded designers, which condense in the limited space of a frame or in the limited time of a snapshot, the entire oral, visual and emotional atmosphere of melodrama. This hiding of passions is also a key uh, component of contemporary advertising in Italy still nowadays. So the play of variations, the urge to translate and the heightening of expression, conveying pathos, meaning and depth to the object or the product. Let me add here one last opposition from 19th century literature opposing the romanticisms of Leopardi and Manzoni. The romanticism of Leopardi emphasizes the self as the focus of attention in its yearning for totality, in its infinite desire for beauty and happiness, in its claim to uniqueness. This I interrogates the objects in relation to its infinite needs as expressed, for example, in the poetic dialogue with the moon of a wandering shepherd in the solitary prairies of Asia. Leopardi asks this mute object, what are you doing moon up in the sky? What are you doing? Tell me, silent moon, investing it with his eyes needs. Conversely, the romanticism of Manzoni is focused on historical realism as seen in the connection of his novel, The Betrothed, to the political and linguistic project of Italian unification and as also synthesized in his letter to Cesare D'Azeglio in the, in the three key words of his literary project, utile, vero e interessante, useful, true, and interesting. These are actually the characters of any, that any product must have. So Leopardi and Manzoni's romanticisms identify in design the concomitant tension to make an object not only desirable, meaningful, and connected to the needs of the eye, but also real, functional, and impactful on society. This is actually the cornerstone of the Italian approach to industrialism as union of aesthetics and functionality, desire and realism, symbolic value and usefulness. Okay, let's gather some information here from the oppositions we trace so far. Now, the virtuoso and the conductor are actually pursuing the same outcome, either of execution or of synthesis, so uniqueness in perfection. The Petrarch Dante dialectics of ingredient and platform aspires to create the same goal of authenticity which is reached either through wholesomeness or a perfect hybridization. Ariosto and Tasso's dialectics of variation, openness, and heightened emotion, closeness, shows a common tension toward freshness and genuineness of invention. And lastly, the opposition of beauty and usefulness has to do with the pursuit of depth, either of meaning, both of meaning and interactions. So the humanistic mindset of the Italian literary civilization based on an oppositional rhythm of wholeness and hybridity, openness and closeness, beauty and functionality, leads to the creation of material forms that aspire to perfection as uniqueness, that aspire to be authentic, fresh in their invention and deep. These are actually the characters that define the appeal of the Italian product. How does this literary background translate operatively then in the industrial age? We'll see this through the example of three intellectual figures of the 20th century, which are key to understanding the Italian intersection of imagination and industry. 
We'll talk about the poet Gabriele D'Annunzio, the painter Fortunato De Pero, and the father of Italian design, Gio Ponti. Now, D'Annunzio is the first Italian writer who understood the impact of poetry on the new industrial market. Although literary criticism negatively portrays him as a decadent voice of European modernism, D'Annunzio was actually the first who constructed his poetic voice, not just as a clearly defined style, so as in Petrarch's model, but also as a brand identity, or in fashion terms, as a griff. In a similar way, he was the first to construct characters in his novel, in novels, as trendsetters, or using our terms, as influencers. If we stop at the literary perspective, D'Annunzio's stylization of language or lifestyle into a serial voice, so what we call D'Annunzianesimo, might appear as a lack of originality. But if we observe him from an industrial point of view, his ability to turn the literary expression into a prototype made his style malleable and applicable to many different realms as we saw in the variation principles of Galileo Ariosto, one theme in multiple ramifications across different spaces, D'Annunzio's stylized voice moved then from poetry to several industrial sectors, authoring serial objects and endowing them with a story. So by authoring the movie Cabiria of 1914, he actually turned cinema from a lucrative industry into a culture maker. And who remembers that actually Giovanni Pastrone was the director of Cabiria? By creating his inimitable self as a replicable lifestyle th through his trend setting characters, but also through his photographic modeling and his own work actually as a tailor and a perfumier, he endowed with aesthetic value the dawning industry of fashion. And also by writing the first airplane novel ever written, Forse Que Si, Forse Que No, maybe yes, maybe not, uh, in 1911, he actually charged the new aviation industry with legend. D'Annunzio also gave a new poetic branding to Borletti's department store, La Rinascente, and to his alarm clock, uh, then speedometer line, Veglia. The second intellectual, the futurist painter uh, De Pero with Giacomo Balla was the first who launched the idea of the Casa d'Arte, so the art house, as a multi-use space of exhibition, analogic combination, and theatrical experimentation. Now, in a way, expanding on the futurist idea of the book, the Tavola Paro Libera, Words in Freedom, or the stage of the Serate as performative spaces of free association, he transformed his house in Rovereto into a mini theater of his own artwork, also of his own children's theater. These are the puppets of it. And as we can see in the miniatures of the children's theater and in his own tapestries, this is like the feast of the chair, heterogeneous items are creatively combined together in the laboratory. And not only objects like a chair, like from the feast, become creative models for their actual equivalents in space. So the design of it, but also the frame. If you see the frame of the Festa de la, uh, de la Sedia, the feast chair, the decoration actually applies to other platforms. So the frame applies to the vest here and also to the design of a platter. Now, in a way, very disparate objects find their sense in the logic of the ensemble, so the orchestra model, of their amalgamation into new unity, so the comedy model, of their extrinsic projection onto a larger space. So here is um, how the children's theater, the Bali Plastici, the plastic dances, actually becomes the space where uh, the enclosed space, the, the frame, the mini stage, the house, uh, where objects become living actors. So these are some of the objects of the house and where objects really heighten their emotional impact as in Tasso's model. And we see this, for example, in the reconfiguration of a lamp uh, into a, a living actor, uh, then into a monkey and the transfiguration of the monkey from the lamp into a statue and into a cover of a magazine 
uh, which then will become the um, puppet for uh, uh, kind of the logo for Campari. The transformation of this puppet into a puppet drinking Campari soda and uh, the transformation of this set of conic elements uh, into advertising posters and the creation of a visual uh, equivalent in the plastic bottle. So the design of a product is always related to the staging of its surrounding space. Lastly, Joe Ponti, who is the father of Italian design and who embodied really and theorized the figure of the designer as a new hybrid intellectual, synthesizing art and technology, imagination and execution, thought and gesture. Now in his pioneering work as the first ever hired chief designer for the porcelain company, Richard Ginori, as an accomplished architect, authoring among others, the famous Pirelli Tower in, in Milan, which was like for many years, the tallest skyscraper in Europe. And also as a theorist of design in his magazine Domus and of the so-called Casa all'Italiana, Ponti really summarizes two of our archetypes of the violinist working on the key ingredients of porcelain vases or the living object and of the conductor. So elaborating the house as a stage of interaction for objects and a larger platform of meaning where they become meaningful. At the same time, in his theory of design as an asystematic philosophy of making things with meaning, he synthesized the tension to create objects and spaces, spaces which are beautiful, so Leopardi, but also impactful, Manzoni, deep in their dialogue with culture, but also light in their dialogue with modern life, fresh or genuine, but also replicable, authentic in the individual invention, but also serial. So in his work, Ponti visualizes a fundamental passage from artisan to designer, from writer to author, from tailor to stylista, the style maker, which coincides with the transition from manual work to prototype planning. Now, these three examples uh, really illuminate not only the intricate web of interactions between the intellectual and material spheres in the Italian milieu, but also the key concepts of the Italian understanding of innovation as a paradoxical philosophy of gesture, where the word gesture from the Latin gerere to bring indicates the intentional connotation of a product of imagination or manufacture to be a carrier of value, of meaning or substance. Now, mentalism, eclecticism and vitalism are really the pillars of this philosophy of Italian innovation. Mentalism is intentionality in planning, both in the making and in the creation of the meaning. Eclecticism as the pursuit of a temperate outcome in the fusion of elements. And vitalism as attention to freshness, livelihood and genuineness in the object, whether in its unique style or in its styling of a way of life. So who is then? The From our conversation, his or her operative and cultural profile is really that of a substantive creator, of a knowledge designer and of an art maker, constantly combining practical and abstract thinking creativity and concreteness. Now, around these parameters that I traced, you can certainly play the game of listing your own Italian innovators. As for me, in addition to inviting you uh, to the gallery of episodes uh, and interviews of, of my YouTube show, I mentioned several of them in, in this presentation on, on Italian innovators. I leave you with two examples. One is actually the Kashmir entrepreneur Brunello Cucinelli who explicitly structured his business around the philosophy of Aristotle, Marcus Aurelius, Saint Benedict, Kant, and Rousseau, and who theorized a new ethical dimension of industrial work, where employees are actually allotted a culture bonus for reading or attending theater plays, and where the city of Solomeo uh, has been the, reconfigured around the headquarters of his company, according to the Renaissance model of the ideal city. The other example I chose, uh, which is also on the cover of this presentation, 
is the mountaineer, journalist, and world traveler, Walter Bonatti, who combined in his feats, adventures, or imprese, the technical skills and discipline of a climb, which is a pretty serious, concrete matter, with the marveling cultural or ethnical narrations that he later published as a journalist and a world traveler. Now, Cuccinelli and Bonatti identify for me the two fundamental traits of the Italian way to innovation. First, the intentionality coming from the imaginative realism of thinking. Imaginative realism of thinking. Pensare in Italian comes from pesare, to weigh. And it's actually a very concrete act, not an abstract thing. And the second is the narrative idea of work or labor as an impresa, which means both company or entrepreneurship in general, but also epic adventure. So work is an epic adventure within this cultural horizon. Now we could go on and on with many more observations, uh, but the scope of this presentation is really to open questions rather than solving them all. Uh, and, and also to think of these um, characters in, in a different light. So at this point, I really would be curious to hear from you, uh, who are your Italian innovators and whom you would choose? And uh, with this, uh, I just want to thank you uh, for, for being here tonight and, uh, and for your um, interest also in kind of my work, my research and, and my YouTube show.